This week on the Owner's Pride podcast, I sit down with Ben Gay III, who is a living legend in the world of sales. With over 50 years experience, he has been the number one salesperson at every organization he's ever worked. Author of The Closers, part one and part two, sold over 10 million copies. He's a trainer, he's a coach, he's a consultant, and he's today's guest on the Owner's Pride podcast. Welcome to the Owner's Pride podcast, where we discuss all aspects of auto detailing with successful detailers and industry leaders around the world. From San Diego, California, your host and our friend, Dan E. Williams. Take it away, Danny. Welcome to the Owner's Pride Podcast. Today on the Owner's Pride Podcast, bring in fire, sales fire. I have Ben Gay III, who is, a, is an accomplished author, a, a trainer, an incredible history of sales, maybe one of the top salespeople in the world. Ben, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine, Dan. How are you? I'm absolutely fabulous. Thank you so much for coming on the Owner's Pride podcast. It's a, a pleasure and honor to get to talk to you. Well, it's my pleasure and my honor. Nothing I like doing better than talking to salespeople. And um, I know I, I mentioned to you at the beginning, you came to this podcast more prepared than most of my guests, which is really good. And I think I'm going to try to get get all of these things from people before I do podcasts from now on because, um, well, maybe people don't have as much information to give me as you do. So I, we'll, we'll just kind of start you're cracking. Free to give them, you're free to give it to them like a template and say, this is what Ben Gay gave me. Give me your equivalent and sort of make them fill in the blanks. It makes a better show for them and you and all your viewers. Now, now, I know you've written books and you do trainings and you've uh, been on all kinds. Of, how many podcasts have you done? I, I don't know. <laughs> Hundreds. Yeah, because in podcasts. Between podcasts and, and webinars, yeah. Yeah, they're only recent over the last 10, maybe 15 years. Uh, I would guess. I do uh, 10 or so a week and have ever since they became popular. Yeah. I think you and I um, became connected on social media. Uh, I was working a lot with my last company developing a dealership appearance package program for a ceramic coating. Um, and I started going to some of the shows, you know, um, Ethical F&I and the, the NADA and all of those shows and meeting all of those people. And I think that's how I, through LinkedIn and Facebook connected with you and you were you were kind enough to message me happy birthday and I was like holy moly Ben Gay messaged me I'm gonna reach out and see if he'll do a podcast <laughs> I about an hour ago I just finished up a morning of selling and I got a, a thing from uh, I don't know how many people it went to but it was addressed to me it wasn't a blast from uh, Jeff Foxworthy the comedian and Marie Osmond, every man's dream girl <laughs> of a certain age. And I thought, sort of like you, I went, wow, Marie and Jeff are talking to me. I can't believe it. But I tried to remain calm. I didn't let it, I didn't let it show. Cool as a cucumber. And it's probably good to keep your composure <laughs> in sales, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's kind of dive into your life and your history. Um, I, I watched a couple other podcasts about you, so I have a little bit of this information. And um, I've interviewed other people who are into sales, and, and much like them, in grade school, essentially, or at a very young age, they were selling stuff. Yeah. How, what was the first thing that you were selling, and, and did you know immediately that you were going to be a, a dominant at sales? I didn't know immediately or dominant either one, but I was my father was a salesperson, always owned his own business. All my aunts and uncles uh, worked in the business or had their own business, et cetera. So I grew up around salespeople and I in my heart knew I wasn't bright enough to be a heart surgeon or something, <clears throat> nor did I have uh, any desire to be. So I just thought I was going to be a sale. I thought that's what people did. Mm -hmm. Find something and sell it, you know. 
And so I did the standard thing, Christmas cards and anything you could find in Boys Life magazine and clip out and they'd send you something, I'd sell it. But I, the one that comes closest to what you just described was I sold Krispy Kreme donuts in Atlanta door to door as a fundraiser for something, the Boy Scouts, the school, the grammar school I was in. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't really remember who, uh, but my father taught me a little script and technique. And I went out and sold Krispy Kremes as fast as they could ship them to me. And uh, the the delivery, the Krispy Kreme delivery truck sent, uh, spent so much time in front of our house. I think they thought we had a sugar problem, but it was just delivering what I was selling. And at the end of it, I didn't make any money. It was a fundraiser. But at the end of it, I came in first. It was my first, first that I was aware of, my first first place sales victory. And I was the number one salesperson in Atlanta uh, for that particular drive. And I won a bright red Columbia bicycle. And I'm not sure I even remember that I knew that that was the prize. I was just competitive. And, but I remember when it arrived, I know exactly what it looked like, where mm. it was sitting in the living room. When I came home from school, mom and dad had set it up and I walked in and saw it. And I thought, wow, because I, I wanted a brand new bike. I was hoping to get one for Christmas. And I said, wow, where did that come from? They said, you won it. Oh, you <laughs> didn't even know that you had won? No, I, I thought I was probably near the top, but I didn't know that it paid anything. If I wasn't one of the brightest students, I was busy <laughs> being the funniest. Yeah. So when they when they announced you won, you could win a bicycle doing this, I was probably clowning around in the back of the room. I really didn't know it was going to happen. When I won a na another national long uh, year long contest. Uh, I didn't know its first prize either. I w it was presidency of a rather large company. Second place, which Zig got, Zig Ziglar, was a Rolls Royce. So I, I have a history of winning contests that I didn't know were going on. Holy moly. And and just to think of the rush that I get when I make a little tiny sale, I can't uh, imagine a Rolls Royce or the being the president of a company uh, from, well, from a sale. <laughs> Yeah, here's something I do that might help people. Uh, and it, just as a tip to you, I keep a list of of items uh, that I want. I could go buy them all today, but I like to earn them. And so I, I've been the head of things for so long. There aren't contests going on that I can win. <laughs> you see what I mean? Yeah, you're the I'm one the putting giver. on the contest now. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm the giver, not the recipient. So I keep a list of things that I want. And every time I do something of significance, taking a book order doesn't count, but anything of significance, a book, a seminar, whatever, I get, I award myself whatever is next on the list. And he, here's one that was sort of cute. I, between seminars, uh, booking a couple of seminars with this company, uh, in advance and the books they would need in advance. Uh, I made roughly a $50,000 sale in about 30 minutes, 50,000 in my pocket profit. Wow. And uh, so uh, I looked down at the, after I got off the phone, I looked down at the list and next up was a package of white socks. One of those bags you get at Walmart yeah, with that was, that was number pairs two of socks that in it. That was the second that prize. Was, that was that was that was the next thing on the list. So I made fifty thousand in cash and got to award myself a package of white socks. I I have bit bigger things on the list uh, at any given time, but I'll never forget that one. I thought, well, it's the the thrill of victory. It's not <laughs> not important what you won. What what is the prize that you get for yourself for being on the Owner's Pride podcast today? It's ah, <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna give my I'm gonna give myself Zig's Rolls Royce. Uh, <laughs> if Tom still has it, I'm gonna give that to myself. So, so when you got that bicycle, I mean, the, you get this rush, or I get this rush yeah. when when I yeah. make a sale, like when you close something, and I mean, even the hunt up to it is pretty, you know, 
the more challenging, and I, I notice the larger the sale is, the longer the runway till you can close it. Frequently, yeah. When you get, when you got that bicycle, was that rush? Did that like spark you to like want to have that rush again? Which is you know taking you uh, yeah, all the way through. Probably subconsciously, I'm not sure it was conscious, but I do remember. Have you ever had something embarrass you where you sort of get flush and you can feel heat oh, yeah. and, and assume you've turned red? Mm -hmm. um, I remember that flush and that rush, as, as you phrase it, when I, A, looked at the bike and had it explained to me that I had won it and it was mine. Uh, I remember that feeling. And I've, I've had that feeling many, many times over the years. And usually when it happens... I flash back to that red bicycle. Yes, so, they are. So, okay. Um, before we, you know, t dive in deeper into sales processes and, and all that, can you throw me out a little bit more of, um, of your career journey? Um, you, you've worked for many companies, including yourself, you know, in, in doing mm -hmm. sales, but just kind of a little, hmm, the three minute, like, I sold okay. this. I sold baby cribs. I sold cars. I sold, you know. I, uh, at 14, started my own lawn mowing business and hired kids in the neighborhood to do it. I did the selling, the inspecting, and the collecting. So thanks to a little trick my father taught me, the, uh, the, the price per lawn or per yard was two or three times higher than anything I'd ever asked or any of my friends had ever asked. So the deal was... I split the money with them. They didn't have the nerve to go up and knock on a door. I did. Uh, they didn't have the nerve to say, I, I would guarantee the kids a minimum. I say the kids, they were my age, they were my friends. Uh, I guarantee them a minimum, I think, of 3 or $4. But main, what they were after was, because of my approach and inspection and making it good and making sure the customer was happy, they got half of what I collected. And my price was pay us what you think it's worth when we're done. And uh, which was scary for me in the beginning. But dad said, don't worry about it. They'll pay you two or three times more than you'd ever ask for. And sure enough, they did. So the kids doing the work made more than they would have ever made. Uh, I made more than I would have ever made because I got half the money. But because I had in the growing season, I would have 20, 25 kids working for me. Holy so I made, way. yeah, I made uh, more than some of the adults in our neighborhood were making, I was told. And uh, in the growing season, it was about a four-month uh, thing, and I did it for three or four years. So there was that. And uh, other little odds and ends here and there, I was always looking for something to, to do. I was a short order cook in a restaurant very briefly, the uh, owner, Bill Hoff apparently didn't think much of my cooking skills, but I couldn't, I couldn't pay for a hamburger there from that day on. If I walked in, everything was free. And uh, uh, other things along the way. And then as a senior in high school, I was standing out outside the school one day and a friend of mine, Jerry Bell, came running out. I said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to Macy's. He said, Davison's, because that's what Davis, what Macy's was called in Atlanta. So the Southerners wouldn't know the Yankees were in town. <laughs> and uh, uh, I said, why? So they're hiring for taking back the returns the day after Christmas. Do you want to go? And I said, sure. So I got in the car with him, went down, applied for the job. They paid me for a week of training to take back returns for one day after Christmas. I never quite figured out that ratio. And it turned into a, I don't know, three, four, five-year gig. I became the youngest buyer in Macy's. I was their top salesperson uh, in, in, in the departments I worked in. And it was great training because the main department I worked in was housewares. And housewares had, I, I'm guessing, counting gadgets and big things and little things, probably had a thousand different items in the department. I'm guessing, I don't know, but lots. Yeah. So one minute I'm selling pots and pans. I sold the first Teflon pans, nonstick pans ever. Uh, I was selling lawnmowers five minutes later. 
and then refrigerators and freezers and 88 cent gadgets and, and whatever. And it became a game to me. If you came in to buy an 88 cent can opener, let's see what else you'll leave with. That's and uh, so that was great training just because different item, different item, different item, different item, shift gears, older lady looking for something, young hotshot who wants the hottest lawnmower in, in the world, you know, that type of thing. I've made about 100,000 face-to-face uh, sales presentations. And with an 86% closing rate, magnificent, right? Yeah. That means 14% of them said no. 14,000 people over the years have listened to the dynamic Ben Gay sales presentation and said no. <laughs> so a lot of uh, selling is not just selling. Uh, it's standing up to the rejection and not taking it personally. I used to think they don't like me. <laughs> Most who said no didn't even know my name. They'd forgotten it as soon as we let go of each other's hands. So it's not personal. They didn't have the money. I didn't explain it properly. You know, whatever, whatever, whatever. So learning how to sell uh, in a manner that people can actually do. I'm not talking about high pressure. You, you say this, they say this, you say this. I'm talking about being not only a master closer, but a sales infiltrator. And I can teach that to anybody because it's what I've done for years. I'm not a hardcore closer. I've trained people who are, but it's just not. If, if I'm in your house trying to sell you a Kirby vacuum cleaner and you tell me to leave, I'm gone. <laughs> I get up and leave. I'm a Southern gentleman. Yeah, you Where know, Kirby, you, Kirby trains them. The sale is not over till you have the money or the police have been called. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I had to accept being punched in the nose a lot myself as I uh, was selling a dealership warranty program and going into dealerships. Those are... Uh, possibly some of the meanest people <laughs> they're they're saying they're the sales people you know so when you're trying to sell something to them you got you better be slick because they will punch you right in the nose figuratively yeah anyway. yeah you, how, how about That's this a hard, tough crowd um what is the difference between how or how does sales differ from marketing and and they're two just very interrelated but two separate pieces altogether yeah. Uh, marketing is the sheepdog of selling. Closing, making a sale, is the shepherd of closing. Uh, people ask me, oh, how has selling changed since you got in it? It really hasn't. The sheepdogs are faster. Uh, you know, I can reach as many people with one hit enter on my computer here. And I can reach as many people as I've probably reached in the last in, in 10 years without the Internet yeah. and maybe more. I don't know. So uh, th that's a technique. But when we get down to the sales copy, the text that's going to make you buy or my live sales presentation uh, or whatever, selling hasn't changed since the days of the Yankee peddler. The customer still wants to know what's in it for me. And if you can explain that clearly and concisely, they'll buy. If you can't, you're out of luck. So sheepdog versus shepherd is marketing versus selling. Some of the people listening uh, may not, based on what you've told me, uh, may not be familiar with scripting and so on. Trust me, it's the secret of selling, uh, a secret of selling. And some would say, oh, I wouldn't be on a script for anything. Uh, really? Really? If you've been in selling over 30 days, you're on a script because you tend to say the same thing over and over and over again, effective or not. So the trick isn't, are you on script? The answer is yes, you are. Are you on a, an effective tested script? And most people aren't. And that's where the problem raises its ugly head. Yeah, we do. Um kind of a, a, a complimentary sales coaching for our um, our op owner's pride installers. Mm -hmm. And um, usually what they come to me and they say, hey, I want more customers. How do I get more customers? And that's like their whole 
thought process and I tell them, okay, we, we can get you more customers, but it's what you do with those customers once you yeah. get them. I can throw a hundred people at you, but if you cannot effectively close the sales, you know, and, and what we're finding kind of over and over, a couple of really big themes. One of them is uh, a lot of these guys are not using a CRM. And I definitely want to talk about that with you because you came from a time when there was not a CRM. So we'll touch that first. And then uh, second, they don't have any kind of a standardized process in place. And I, I know I'm kind mm -hmm. of, I took a huge bite of, of an apple to throw here, but first let's talk real quick about a CRM and how did, how the heck did you organize your customers prior to having that? I mean, was it all just written down in a, in a book or three by five library cards? <laughs> That's literally how it was done. Uh, unless you had a better mind than I did. I had, I couldn't remember all those people. So at first you learn to write it down uh, today, enter it. Uh, but with three by five library cards, we, we had a room at Holiday Magic. You remember those little bitty file cabinets you saw at libraries, the Dewey Decimal System? Absolutely. Okay. A, a room full of those little bitty drawers, floored of almost as high as you could reach, all the way around a significantly sized room. And that was our computer of the era. When people trained somebody out in the field, you had to fill out three cards, one for the alphabetical file, one for everybody you personally had ever trained, and one based on geography, everybody in Georgia, for instance. Mm -hmm. And so I could find a per I could find everybody you ever trained uh, or everybody in Georgia or whatever seems sort of cumbersome, but I could find them probably quicker than you can find them on a computer, you know, because you got to shift, you know, shuffle through stuff on a computer with the old system. I knew right where it was. And I had a prospect file. One of the problems with a prospect file is many salespeople who are afraid to make sales presentations because they fear rejection, spend the first half of the day reorganizing their prospect file. <laughs> <laughs> like they did yesterday <laughs> dragging some yeah. feet <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you can't fall victim to your prospect <laughs> file uh, but i still uh here are my notes for you and i talking today i don't know why your your screen is backwards to what i'm used to <laughs> there it is your name the company name your email uh the number to call if things go wrong and we didn't hook up and so on. And people say, well, why don't you put that on your computer? I said, well, if things go wrong, we do. Somebody does. I never look it up that way. I, I still do it by hand. And when we do our, our sales coaching with the guys, um, we kind of give them templates for every step of the, mm -hmm. of the, you know, process. Mm -hmm. we, and so having a script is that essentially is having a process. Is, is it the same mm -hmm. thing? Sure. Basically, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and now, can do you, how do you get through to people to get them to really buy into they need to follow a process and and if you kind of follow that script or process over and over, mm -hmm. it's it's a a series of events or things that you say or do that are going to try to get to the result at the end, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the steps. But it's hard to get people to really to buy into that they kind of have to do that. And and that kind of takes me to your um, your books where you we were talking earlier about um, the closers too and the infiltrating sales and where you kind of said really anybody that is that's the golden ticket right there. Correct. Can we talk and a little easy bit to about do. that? Sure. Uh, and for those who are got something to write on, let me show you that. When I'm done, go to stores.ebay.com slash Ronzoni Books, R-O-N-Z-O-N-E Books, B-O-O-K-S. If it, that the thing above it is my website, if you want to go there, that's fine. But for your listeners and people I do webinars with, I always send them to stores.ebay.com forward slash Ronzoni books because there uh, all of my materials 
are featured with special pricing, lower than I sell them at my own website, and free shipping. So if you're inclined to get any of the series, do it that way. This is part one in the series. Closers, I don't know why your thing is backwards, <laughs> at least on my screen there. Closers part one. This is the best-selling, most powerful, most popular book on selling and closing ever written. It's at that website. Uh, you and I were talking uh, mm -hmm. before the show. Ten and a half million copies sold when we quit counting 25 years ago. That's incredible. So it's, it's obviously some figure higher than ten and a half million. This is the red raw meat of selling. This is the kicks, the blocks, the punches of selling the red raw meat and you need to know that information although frankly most of your viewers and listeners will never do it because it is i say this they say that you need to know what's going on but you don't have to do it that way so people kept asking me who had worked with me over the years they said you don't really do that you understand it and you know it but you don't do it and I said, no, what I do is a softer, gentler. It's what, what sophisticated people really do with that information is in the closers part two. And I will again try and get it in front of the camera. <laughs> <laughs> uh, closers part two. This is what sophisticated people really do with the kicks, the blocks, and the punches in part one. More importantly... On page 257, there's a chapter called Sales Infiltration. Starts on page 257 in the Closers Part 2. I think you can at least see the title there. That is the best thing, and I say this humbly having written it, that is the best thing ever written about selling. It is exactly what most of us really do. We teach one thing from the stage, but like Zig, uh, you know, and you say this and they say this and so on. He didn't do that. Uh, the, he had that knowledge. He knew the procedures. He knew the systems. But he was Zig Ziglar. And what he did was he endorsed the first he sold Zig. Then he endorsed the product or service he was selling. So when I'm selling something, your products and services or mine or Kirby vacuum cleaners or land in Arizona. I sold two lots this morning in Arizona. Uh, when, uh, when I'm selling something, first I sell Ben Gay. And then Ben Gay endorses, if you're old enough to remember the good housekeeping seal of approval, I assume they still have it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But it used to be there was a generation of people before me wouldn't buy anything that didn't have a good housekeeping seal of approval because that answered all your questions. They did it and tested and tried it and this and that, and they tell you the good, the bad, and the, and the in-between. Uh, but if good housekeeping said it was good, you could spend your money and be confident. I sell Ben Gay and using sales infiltration. And then when I'm done selling Ben Gay, about 5% of my presentation is the product or service itself, which carries Ben Gay's seal of approval. And if I say it's good, I'm the good housekeeping of whatever I'm selling at the time, they'll buy it. That's called sales infiltration. So you're establishing your credibility and you're, right. you being a knowledgeable person, and then they trust you and then... Trust makes is the part key. too easy. Okay. Yeah, people buy from people they know, like, and trust. Well, I can get to know someone in a minute or two. And they're even faster than that, Dan. Most customers make up their mind. They can change it if you're really good, but I prefer not to have to dig my way out of the hole. Most customers make up their mind in the first 10 or 15 seconds of encountering you because they take their little computer like brain. They look at you the way you walk, talk, carry yourself, dress, whatever. And they lay you up against all of the, depending on their age, hundreds of thousands of people they've met over the years. And they decide if you fit the profile of somebody they like. 
or truck, preferably both. The three rules of selling are or direct mail or marketing are test, test, test yeah, to find, find out what works. works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you got to understand what you're selling at any given time. First, you're selling yourself or because the ad was non-threatening, getting them to take some minor action, and then a little bit better action, then send me your money. It sounds like you kind of put the steps in front of them and you like cattle going through a, you know, a maze. You just, you had to. I'm the, I'm the sheep dog. In that case, I'm the sheep dog. That was the analogy you used earlier, which is absolutely perfect. I, I like how that circled back. It makes a lot of sense. So um, sometimes with what we're selling at Owner's Pride and in the, in the um, Owner's Pride authorized installers is a ceramic coating that goes on your car. Right. And mm -hmm. sometimes what happens, I, I think, is they'll get too into the the science of it and like kind of get deeper into it than the customer really has. And so, we, you know, we tell them, sell the sizzle, not the steak where Elmer Wheeler is, is that who, is that? who said that? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Sell the sizzle, not the steak. He also said nothing happens till somebody sells something. So what we tell him is like, don't, you don't have to tie down in the chemistry of it and like this, but you <laughs> want to tell them what it does for it and make it as simple as possible to be, if I buy this, this is how my life is going to be better or what's going to be improved for me. And like, d don't worry about so much. Um, is that, is, do you find this to be the case really? Spot universally? on. Absolutely spot on. People don't care about the details. They care about what's in it for me. And you're going to have to tell me. And once you tell me, do I trust you? It's that simple. The, I'm told, I don't know this for a fact, that the average car has 7,000 parts. Nah, when you're selling me a car, I care about three of them. Yeah, three or four. Where's the ignition? Where's the steering wheel? Where's the gas pedal and where are the brakes? Yep. <laughs> Beyond that, I got it. It's got four wheels, got an engine in the front, <laughs> you know. Oh, and I also want your cell phone number because if any of those don't work, I'm not calling triple A, I'm calling you. And if you want my future business, you'll take care of it. In fact, if you're a good salesperson, you'll give me your business card with your cell phone written on the back, like this is special, nobody else gets it. And with the instructions, when something happens that isn't what I promised you, you call me and I'll, I will handle it. Another little um, thing that we tell our guys to do is as soon as they start any sales conversation or a, whether it's on the phone or in person to offer their most expensive package that they have right out of the chute, because we, we you know, we say, hey, if you never offer it, then you're never going to sell it. A and B, it's kind of an extreme anchor. So anything you offer after that, you know, really high price ticket item is going to seem like a pretty good deal. Mm hmm. How you feel about that? Uh, the way I do it in most of the scripts that I write for people and in my own uh, products and services, <clears throat> we show them what each thing costs uh, if if purchased separately. Mm -hmm. And so if you if you buy all of this one step at a time, which you will eventually, everything we sell is fantastic and you're going to want it. So if you do it that way and string out the process, it will total, I'm just making up some numbers, it will total $3,000. But if you buy the package that I recommend and sales infiltration will tell you how to set that up. If you buy the package that I recommend, you can get it all today for 1500. So you save 1000 five hundred dollars and you get the best package to do whatever we're doing in the world here's what i used to say to my chemists uh in the cosmetic company in the vitamin company in the motor oil additive company i said i want you to put me in a position where i walk i can walk to the front of the room and hold up i don't think to hold up let's pretend like this is a chemical product <laughs> it's a, i think it's a dust roller or something I want to walk to the front of the room, hold this up and say, you may have some 
cosmetic that you, you prefer the color of or the smell of or what have you. I understand that. But what I want to promise you is this is the best product that can be no product. If it costs $500 versus our $50 can be any better because we offer pharmaceutical grade ingredients. Doesn't get any better. We're just down to personal taste now. So I said to the chemist, when I walk to the front of the room, I want to tell hundreds of people, thousands of people in front of me via closed circuit television, thousands more. There isn't a better product in the world. There can't be. If there were, we'd sell it. Now, can't be. So, okay, having said that, do you have to believe in what you sell? And, and kind of what's the difference between a sleazy salesman and, and a and a... I guess, non-sleazy salesman? Would that be believe, <laughs> believing in what they sell? <laughs> it, it certainly helps. I sold many things that I wouldn't buy because I wasn't qualified to buy them. I wasn't in that position. I didn't have that need. But if I find someone who does have the need, I can be very enthusiastic about selling it to them because it fits them. I used to sell the first video game machines. It's called Pong. Mm -hmm. And they, we put them in, we sold them as an investment. They went in pizza parlors and so on. And you split the money 50 50 with the owner of the restaurant. And now our next trick was to convince people they ought to drop their money other than in a pinball machine in a video game that they didn't understand. So uh, that was our. Uh, sales challenge. We got around that by scripting, uh, by demonstrating, et cetera. And we did, did a wonderful job and it was the beginning of Atari and so on. I, however, never bought one, but I never made a claim that I did. I didn't have time to be running around gathering up quarters uh, in pizza parlors. I was making a lot of money. <laughs> I was very busy if I went in a pizza parlor, it was because my kids wanted pizza that night. Short of that, I wouldn't have been in one, wouldn't have done. But I saw one gentleman, I remember, I think it was 50 units, little short sales presentation, 50 units. And we also had placement service. Not only you buy the 50 machines, we'll put them in 50 places. And he said to me somewhere uh, in the conversation, uh, do you own any? And I said, no, I don't. Didn't lie. No, I don't. <laughs> no is a complete sentence. I don't and I won't because I'm already making the kind of money I hope you make with these machines. I'm already doing it. So, no, I don't have to do that. But I if I were in your position, I would. Uh, and uh, But I'm not. So you don't have to lie about it. Here's what here's where the break though comes. You don't sell crap to anybody. You may not I'm not a good uh, prospect to buy an oil tanker. Land or sea. I don't I wouldn't know what to do with it. It's a business I don't understand. I wouldn't get in it. But if you were in it and knew the business and so on, I could sell you an oil tanker with no problem. Yeah. Safe to say if somebody's standing in your detail shop that they're you're selling them something that that they could use. Yeah, yeah, that helps. <laughs> they're, they're not there because they're lonely, <laughs> right? Usually, <laughs> um, yeah. So, how about I heard like before that people say it takes like seven to ten touches before you close a sale, and you know, and maybe with overcoming objections, it, it, do you find that to be the case, or is no? If that were true, Dan. Uh, there would be nobody left in selling. People don't like, generally speaking, some of us do, but most people don't really like to sell. They don't, they're afraid to ask for the order. They fear rejection. And so if they had to ask for the order or have seven touches, they'd be out of business before the fifth touch or the third touch or what have you. And I'll tell you something really funny. Two friends of mine, two of my older mentors, I was the kid when I started. Now I'm an old mentor myself, but I was 25 when I was running this huge international company. And Dr. Napoleon Hill was one of my mentors, but he was biologic. I was 25. He was 84 the day we met. He was biologically old enough uh, to be my great-grandfather. So the uh, 
you know, time has passed, but they, uh, Wade Cannon and Ray Considine, two of my older mentors, not that old, but older mentors, were asked one day to write an article for a famous sales magazine. And they did about the importance of marketing and, and selling and blending the two together and so on. And when it, it came back, they sent the publisher. When it came back from the publisher, the publisher said, I want more specific examples. So Ray and Wade made up the chart that you still see in magazines like that and in Harvard studies and so on. The average sale is made after the eighth contact and after the 47th time you ask for the order and after this and after that and after that and so on. And I always laugh when I think of it because if that were true, nobody would be in selling because most of us really uh, can't stand rejection, et cetera. But they made up those figures and they told me about it and laughed about it almost 50 years ago. <laughs> and so, and I'm still seeing it. Now the numbers change a little bit, you know, 22% goes to 25. So somebody can't be accused of plagiarism, but here's the deal. The list was made up. Now stop and think about salespeople. Do you really believe salespeople keep track of, they should, but they don't keep track of the 17th call and the 30 time, third time they ask for money and so on. If you really think about it, the next time you see that example, study the numbers and go, they made this up. Mm -hmm. And they did. <laughs> Wade Cannon and Ray Considine made it up. Funny. I, I've like literally said that. I'm like, it takes an average of five to seven touches before you can close the sale. Uh, yeah, that's to keep uh, salespeople going, you know, uh, the uh, I've tried three times. Well, the studies show that it takes five to seven times trying to keep him in the business long enough to make some more attempts. So, okay. So I'm a one call closer, so I don't have a lot of patience with that stuff. When I come to see you and I leave, you've bought or we're done. That's that's awesome. So it, so with what we're selling with a ceramic coating for a car, they can go to different. There's different companies that provide the products. Again, we have the only compliant warranty, so that's kind of our bedrock of what we have that nobody mm -hmm. else can touch. And I really push my guys to sell that fact. Um, but for overcoming objections in that case, because you're a closer right now, let's close this sale. What if a customer, you know, throws out at you, well, I'm, I want to check. There's other brands that I would like to check or other detail shops that I would like to check. How do you handle an objection like that and still keep them on track and moving towards your goal? You become a sales infiltrator starting on page 257 closes part two, <laughs> and that doesn't come up. I never get, I'm going to go check somewhere else. Man, I just don't I get am, it. I am ordering this book as soon as we get off of here. It's I, well, good. I have to have it. I have uh, to have it. So sales infiltrators bring up the opportunity. Um, let's just give you a few little tastes. Among the earliest things I say to a prospect are, uh, I, I'm a sales infiltrator. That means I will treat you fairly, squarely, decently, by the rules. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. They always say, yeah, fair enough. Uh, any question you ask me, I will, if I know the answer, I will give you a straight answer to it. Uh, or go find the answer. Fair enough. Fair enough. I'll be straight with you. You be straight with me. I call it straight, straight. Fair enough. Fair enough. Let me explain that one step further. When we're done, I'm going to want a yes or no, and I understand either one. And you don't tell me that you have to talk, talk to your brother-in-law in Cleveland who is in the auto detail business. Yeah. Because you wife. don't have a brother-in-law, <laughs> and he's not in Cleveland, and he's not in the auto, and now they're laughing. And I say, fair enough, right. So then we do the presentation, and I get down to the magic close, which is on page I don't know what page it's on, but, but it's it in the on chapter. 257. <laughs> page 257, you get down to the magic close, which I now have the right to use. I've earned the right to get in the position to use it. And then he says, well, I've got to check with my brother. And I say, ah, 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 ah. 
we've already covered that. You promised me you wouldn't do that. We're down to the yes or no time. So tell me the sincere questions you have. So you can do anything with a prospect, anything, if you get permission to do it in advance. You can ask them any question. If you ask them for permission to ask any question in advance, and while there's not a question on the table, they'll agree to anything. The question may be a little stickier when you actually ask it, but they've already agreed that it's okay. So it's it's being upfront and positive. And your thing about your the, the super duper warranty that you have, that's your version of me standing on stage with a bottle of face cream in my hand saying, you can't get it any better. This is the best there is. Yeah. You know, you want it in pink instead of white. I can't help you buy some food coloring or something, but it doesn't get any better than this. So when they say, well, I got to check around, I said, well, no matter where you check around, like we agreed when we started, you can check around, but you won't find anybody that has the extended super duper warranty. We're the only ones. And there's something else you can only get here. Me. Here, I come with it, and I give you my personal word, you will be a happy camper before we're done. How about um, after a sale is over? Um, I, I mean, a lot of the customers that we deal with, we don't want to, even if I sell somebody something with a seven-year warranty with it, I, it's not that I don't want to see that customer again for seven years. What kind of reaching out do you do? Do you... If you're in the same company, if you switch to mm -hmm. another company and you're selling something totally different, obviously it's this is not relevant. But say you're in the same company and, and how do you keep engaging those customers over and over, both customers that you've sold to and then to customers who maybe you did not close the sale, but there's still a potential target down the road? Well, uh, part A and B. Part A is if it was a significant sale. If, if uh, somebody buys a, a, a book from me, I don't necessarily know their birthday. Unless it comes up in conversation, in which case I make a note. Now I know your birthday and you know. Uh, I, I, in your case, I don't know if Facebook told me or LinkedIn told me or so. If somebody told me it was your birthday. So notice, happy birthday. And if it, more than a year has gone by, you got another one that said, uh, and yet, uh, yet again, or and, and again, so I'm, I'm saying it's your birthday. I know that. And I also know that I've already told you a birthday once. I think I have four versions. So you can't scroll back and go, oh, he's just saying the same thing to everybody every time. And look how it worked. My, We're sitting here on the, the talking to each other right now, which would not be happening exactly. if you not reached out and said happy birthday. Well, that's uh, a big part of it. So, uh, when they leave you and you, they may not see you for seven years, if left to their own devices, I know their birthday, if it's a significant ticket, and I think yours is, I know their birthday. I know uh, today is St. Patrick's Day. Uh, a lot of my friends got St. Patrick's Day things because I know I, I didn't send it to everybody because I want to know if your name was Leibowitz, I didn't send you happy St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> but if your name is O'Reilly, I did. So I, I stay in touch that way. And then part B, you have a referral system. Uh, I know you're going to love this. And from time to time, I'll be sending you cards and so on. Every time I do, I want you to say to yourself, who do I know that could enjoy the same service and quality of, of product and so on that I do? And every time you do that and they tell me that you sent them, I'm going to do something nice for you. And I don't know your mathematics, but it could be $50. It could be a dinner card, you know, a, a, a free pancake breakfast at Denny's. But I do things for people that do things for me. So, not so you so have much. a referral system. Not so much you're just um, throwing out a newsletter and blasting everybody with it, but you're like actually taking those customers that you've done business with and hitting them with something throughout the year that says personal me to you 
and it touches right. them. Not only throughout the year, it's throughout their life. Until I get a copy of a death certificate, I'm drip marketing to you. I'm staying in front of you. Drip marketing. I'm sending, yeah. Here's a quote I thought you might like. Uh, I have, uh, I, I make notes during the day. Here, I'm going to try one more time to hold something up. This is a three ring binder and there's notes stuck on the front of it. Those are the next one, two, three, four, five. And then the book is full of quotes, but the ones on the outside are the next five Facebook things I'm going to send out. You know, and I say for my morning reading, Winston Churchill said this, sent one out the other day, had a tremendous response. I said, I just saw, it's one of my favorite quotes. Forgive me if I've sent it to you before but I just love it. It's a great life lesson. It was from General Patton who said uh, a, a plan violently, a good plan violently executed today is better than a perfect plan executed next week. So, you know, and Dr. Hill taught me when he caught me dithering one time over a decision that wasn't that looking back, it was really not a tough decision. He said, Ben, you're dithering take action. Uh, so I send those. It has nothing to do with books or anything I'm doing, but it puts my name in front of them on a regular basis. Four or 5,000 people at least, even after Facebook and LinkedIn filtering and all that, four or 5,000 people a day, most days, certainly five days a week, get something from me. And they're just, it's something and that's it, like helpful or entertaining. It's not a, yeah, you're not asking yeah, them for sometimes anything. It, nope. I did one the other day, got a tremendous response and it was two years old. It came back around, you know, as a reminder in your memories, here's mm -hmm. something you've sent out before. And it was about not being able to find my car keys. So I yelled out in the house to anyone who could hear me, does anyone know where I put my car keys? And one of our nieces was here visiting a little smart aleck. <laughs> so from up in the bedroom, I heard her say, have you looked in the refrigerator yet? Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm at that age where they're very likely to be in the refrigerator. <laughs> and a friend of mine from Taiwan said, uh, well, did you look? And I said, yes, dot, 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 but very quietly. <laughs> okay. Now that has nothing to do with hiring me for a seminar or buying books or hiring me to write your direct mail letters or whatever, nothing. But it says, I'm Ben Gay and I care about you. And just for anybody that might want to know, you'll soon be able to get key fob replacement from owner's pride. <laughs> there you go. Holy cow. Um, there, we've, we've covered so much and I, I, I have to get this book. I think that's, um, how about, how about selling from a menu? The, the, the items that we're going to be selling, uh, through this, like kind of, they're basically like the F and I products. So you have a full detail shop with mm -hmm. all of those services and then, um, key fob replacement, dent and ding glass, um, all these other ancillary warranties, if you will. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, um, it's best to like kind of just size a customer up and think of what would be the most relevant for them just by looking at them or, or, or they should all be sold off of a menu as in how they do it in an F and I office. Mm -hmm. Test, test, test. Every other customer do it one way. Every other customer do it the other way and see where the results are coming from. Uh, when all else fails, get them to buy something, then you can upgrade. Now you're a trusted supplier, so you can upgrade. So make it easy for them to buy. If, if they don't buy anything, it, the day, it's not over, but the job gets a lot harder. Do you think that, that people are more apt to buy something if they have a fear of loss, like loss aversion, or if they feel that they're going to gain something? Uh, that was uh, Elmer Wheeler also. Hope of reward, fear of loss. I'm going to have to here's, look up this Elmer Wheeler because I keep saying stuff that's yeah. his that I don't even know it. The uh, Well, that's 
the ultimate compliment. It's entered our language, you know, yeah. hope, reward, fear, or loss. And most people, it's a little bit of both, but mainly it's trust in you. I'll tell you a quick Elmer Wheeler story. Can I take a couple of minutes? Yeah. Okay. Elmer Wheeler was hired by F.W. Woolworth. A lot of you people don't know what it is, but Woolworths used to be the largest retail chain of any kind in the world. It was five and dime store, basically. I can still smell it as I'm telling you the story. <laughs> Hard, old wooden floors and popcorn and cheap perfume when you walked in. That was the smell. <clears throat> Elmer Wheeler was hired the most profitable item they had behind the lunch counter and Woolworths was the largest restaurant chain in the world with, I forget what it was, something I used to know, 49 miles of lunch counters in every store. They Within a store, they were the largest restaurant chain. They, they, they never were Woolworths come in and eat. It was just there. So the most profitable single item they sold were eggs uh fried boiled soft boiled whatever and uh so they hired elmer he came in sat down at the end of the counter and for eight hours watched what was going on and he learned something he'd never known before a lot of people when they order a milkshake if they have a choice like to have a raw egg in it, it that may be a, some health problem now but it wasn't when they hired him so he watched, but the waitresses never asked, do you want an egg in it? They had to know that they want to and put an egg in it. And after some period of time, he started taking notes. And what he wrote down was a phrase that was so successful uh, that he created a national egg shortage in the United States. It took chicken farmers like six months to dig out from under. They didn't have enough chickens to produce all the eggs Woolworth was ordering. And his phrase was, and training, he, Woolworth used to have these counters. They went along about three feet, then they went out in sort of a semicircle and then back to three feet. So they, like a Disneyland line, they could get more seats mm -hmm. in less linear feet, you know. So, and most waitresses had one of those sort of stations. When she walked into her side of the U, she might have eight or nine seats around her. And she might be doing that for two or three. So, he put a dozen eggs under, and probably more later, a dozen eggs under the counter in each one of those U-shaped counter sections. And when somebody would order a milkshake, she would reach under the counter pick up two eggs in one hand and say one egg or two mm. choice, choice clothes, uh, one egg or two. Well, enough people who never ordered an egg in their milkshake in their life, they didn't know it was an option said one enough people ordered one said two. They'd always ordered one. Now they're ordering two. a national egg shortage with this close is how tricky it was one egg or two. I see when you go through like a, a drive through and you, and get some food, they'd say, do you want medium or large? Like they don't even mm -hmm. offer the small option. I, the same thing, right? Right. Yep. And do you want fries with that? Yeah. Man. <laughs> McDonald's business was built on that. Process, process, trust, process, trust, and process. That's what it comes down to. Exactly. Yeah. Trust and process. Well... Ben, thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to bestow some knowledge of sales on um, on the Owner's Pride podcast audience. Um, I really, really appreciate it. It's uh, quite an honor to be with uh, an accomplished person like yourself on the show. Well, thank you very much. I wish my wife was here to hear that. She has <laughs> doubts about the accomplished part. Well, but, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll send that... her the link and she could listen to the very last uh, couple minutes of it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'd love to be with you again. Anybody who orders will ship it the same day you order. Uh, if you want it priority mail, mention that. If you charge for that, whatever priority mail is. Otherwise, we'll be out book rate, and you'll have it about a week after you order it. Excellent. I, I, I know what I'm doing next. All right. I'll be looking for your order, Dan. It's coming. It's coming. Thank you so much, <laughs> Ben. You have a great day, and thank you again. Thank you. 
And thanks for watching the Owner's Pride Podcast. Questions and comments, leave them for us on the Owner's Pride Podcast Facebook page. Likes, shares, and comments are always appreciated. Stop by ownerspride.com to pick up a bottle of ceramic detail spray, my personal favorite product in the line. And until next time, stay glossy. We hope you've enjoyed today's presentation of the Owner's Pride Podcast. To learn more about our products, become an authorized installer, or to get a quote, visit ownerspride.com.